Hey everybody, Jonathan here. Before the episode starts, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our guest. So I didn't have to read her bio while she was sitting there waiting for us. So our guest this week is Annie Duke. Annie is an author, speaker, and consultant in the decision-making space, as well as special partner focused on decision science at First Round Capital Partners, which is a seed stage venture fund. Annie's latest book, Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away, was released in 2022 from Portfolio, a Penguin Random House imprint. Our previous book, Thinking in Bets, is a national bestseller and one of my favorites. As a former professional poker player, she's won more than $4 million in tournament poker. During her career, Annie won a World Series of Poker bracelet and is the only woman to have won the World Series Poker Tournament of Champions and the NBC National Poker Heads Up Championship. What a mouthful. Annie loves to dive into decision-making under uncertainty, and her latest obsession is on the topic of quitting. In particular, she's on a mission to rehabilitate the term and get people to be proud of walking away from things. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today we are joined by very special guest, Annie Duke. Annie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I have to start off by thanking you. Because, oh. yes, it's a, one of my dad's favorite things to say is often wrong, but never in doubt, which unfortunately infected me. And I'm, I have grown up always being extremely certain about everything. And, and it's a bad habit. And when I read Thinking in, I believe it was from Thinking in Bets, where you it, tell the yeah. story of Wanna Bet, and that like cured me. It cured me. Like every time oh, I would, amazing. yeah, it's unreal. It's like every time I make some proclamation from the hill, then I think in my head, if somebody bets me on this, I'm definitely going to back down. Such a great little tactic. But so I wanted to get that out of the way. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Cool. Well, we originally reached out to talk to you. We did a couple of episodes about quitting and your book Quit, of course, came up. And so we wanted to have you on and talk about that. But also, I feel like your bigger your bigger topic is just helping people make better decisions. So, you know, we want to kind of touch on a lot of those areas today. Yeah. Well, quitting is a part of making better decisions. Yeah. That's, that's where that book came around. But yeah, my, my broadly what I, I guess I'm obsessed with is decision making under uncertainty. So uh, that goes back to what you said about often wrong, but never in doubt. Uh, most of the decisions we made are, are make are under conditions of uncertainty and people react to that in different ways. Uh, one of the ways is that uh, you're never in doubt, right? That you're, that you're overconfident and you're overly certain. Uh, sometimes people react to that uh, with, you know, what we think of as analysis paralysis, right? And an ability to make a decision until you feel like you can get to certainty and that causes you to slow down. So it's either uh, you convince yourself that you're certain of things that you're totally not, or you recognize that you're not certain and that totally paralyzes you from making a decision uh, and you end up gathering information and thinking about it long past the point at which you should have acted. So the message that I broadly am trying to get across all of my writing is you should embrace the uncertainty. The way to become a really good decision maker is neither to become paralyzed or to be overconfident and convince yourself uh, of some false sense of certainty or project some false sense of certainty, but embrace the fact that the decisions that we make are uncertain. And that is going to actually help you to be a better decision maker because you're embracing the reality and you become less anxious because you recognize that there is uncertainty in every decision that you make and you're doing the best that you can, or at least trying to do the best that you can through putting really good decision process in place. Excellent. So can you, maybe a good place to go from there would be, what's the difference between a good outcome or a result and a good decision or vice versa, a bad outcome <laughs> and a bad decision? Yeah. Um, the, 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 the two are, so a good outcome is just an outcome that is desirable to you. So uh, we have goals. And we're trying to gain ground toward our goals. We're trying not to lose ground. Uh, and we ha when we have an outcome that causes us to gain ground, uh, we would consider that a good outcome. Uh, like a bad outcome is, is losing ground. Now, what is a good decision? That's very complicated. And it has to do with uh, what is the process that you have in place in terms of making the decision. Uh, most of which we can kind of think of as um, 
are you actually uh, in an intentional way trying to make a good forecast of what the future might hold for you? Um, and forecasting involves thinking about what you know, thinking about other sources of information, uh, trying to imagine what the different possible outcomes are that could occur from any option that you're considering, trying to figure out how much each of those outcomes would cause you to gain or lose ground, uh, what the probability of each of those outcomes are. I know this sounds kind of overwhelming, but uh, once you put it into practice, it does create really good decision process. And then actually a, a subtlety in there is, um, are you spending an appropriate amount of time on the decision, right? So uh, we don't want to spend a half an hour trying to decide something off a menu. Uh, we'd like to spend much less than that. Uh, but you also don't want to spend a half an hour deciding who to marry. Mm -hmm. We'd want to spend more time than that, right? So we want to get, we want to actually be thinking really thoughtfully about um, that type of process and how much effort we should be putting into the decision. So that's going to determine whether a decision is good or not, which is by process. Now, notice nowhere in there did I say that uh, what makes a good decision is a good, that you get a good outcome from it or what makes a bad decision is that you get a bad outcome from it. And the reason for that has to do with one of the sources of uncertainty that we have in our decision-making, um, and that is uh, luck. So uh, I can make a perfectly good decision, like following all the traffic rules and going through a green light, and I can get in an accident. And it doesn't mean that the decision to proceed through a green light uh, was a bad decision. Um, there was just luck that influence the outcome. Um, and then there's a, another thing, which is that there are things that are just kind of uh, unknowable or unavailable to us in terms of knowledge. We're, we're usually deciding things without perfect information because we're not omniscient. Um, and sometimes after the fact, um, there'll be some piece of knowledge that like reveals itself to you uh, where you're like, oh, if I had known that, I would have made a different choice. Um, and so you can get a bad outcome because there's something that you don't know, but it's actually totally reasonable for you not to know that. So um, an example of that would be, uh, I don't know about you, but at the beginning of the pandemic, I had Lysol wipes and I was wiping down all of my boxes and, um, you know, sterilizing my vegetables before I would touch them. And all of my packages sat outside for 24 hours before I would go and put my fingers on them. Um, and that does, just because it turned out later, that uh, that really wasn't the way that COVID spread doesn't mean that at the time it was a poor decision for me to do that because there was just information that I didn't know and couldn't know, right? So my best understanding at that time was COVID was spread through respiratory droplets, which could certainly be on things, right? Like if a delivery person delivered Indian food to me or something, it could be on the package. I turned out later that that wasn't the case, but there was no way for me to know that. So that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it was a bad decision to do that. And so we have trouble separating out decision quality from outcome quality. It's like uh, and we we tie them together way too closely. So it's like we're all walking around saying, oh, if you got in an accident, you must you know, you made a bad decision, even if the decision was to proceed through a green light and vice versa. It's like we're all walking around saying, oh, you got through the intersection safely. That was a good decision, even if you, you know, went through a red light at a, at a busy intersection and happened to somehow get through safely. Um, and we do this, you know, in that particular case, it's like super obvious because we kind of know what the decision quality is, but we do this all the time. Like if we hit sales targets, for example, like we hit the sales target, we think it, we must've made great decisions to get there. We miss the sales target. We think that we must've made poor decisions to get there. And neither of those things is necessarily true, right? You'd have to understand how did you come up with the projection? What were the decisions that you made along the way? What were the influence of luck? Uh, what were the things that you couldn't have known, right? Like um, you're, the person that you're, is point for you at the company that you're interfacing with maybe gets fired and there's no way for you to know that's going to happen and it ends up affecting your bottom line. So this is a problem that we call resulting. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest problems that we have in decision making is just these these inaccurate links between outcome quality and decision quality. It reminds me of survivorship bias, where mm. you get interviews with all these unicorn founders. And it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, like, did, they don't talk about really, they talk about, generally, you hear them 
like here's what we did, but no one ever gets into like why they decided to do something or, or whether or not the decisions they made were objectively reasonable. Yeah. And not only that, I think more importantly is that they don't talk about all the people who made similar decisions or sometimes better decisions and didn't succeed. So uh, if we can't see that negative space of like all the people who tried similar things and failed and actually could have had a better product, right, or could have made better decisions and just certain things didn't work out for them, maybe due to luck, that we take the people who survive and we think that we can work backwards from that to get to how we might succeed. And I think the most absurd one is sort of that trope of, you know, uh, most billionaires get up at 4 a.m. So thinking, well, if I get up 4 a.m., then I'll become a billionaire. And we're just getting like the causality totally wrong because of survivorship bias. So you're exactly right. Like with survivorship bias, what happens is that we tend to hear about successes and we don't hear about failures. And uh, the problem for that is twofold. One is that you think that all the thing that this, things that the successes did was actually causal. Uh, to their success in a sense where if you repeated those exact same things, you would also become successful, which we know isn't true because there's, again, a very uncertain relationship between outcome quality and like the things that you do. Um, but the other problem is that we just, we don't really have a reference class for that in the sense that we don't understand, was this person unusual, right? Um, compared to all, you know, we don't know out of how many right? Like, so you succeeded, but out of how many who tried. So like one of my, I, I saw a great example of this on Twitter, like maybe six months ago, where, you know, we know that in venture right now, there's a big contraction, very hard to raise money right now in venture. Um, and that was even more so like nine months ago. And somebody tweeted out like saying, to all the people who feel like giving up because they've been trying to raise a round and failing to do so, I, I pitched, I can't remember how many people it was, you know, and it took me 21 months to raise my Series A. And so you should keep trying. <laughs> and, and it was like a completely honest post, like, don't give up because it took me 21 months and pitching however many people. And of course, it's like, okay, but... <laughs> how many people also waited 21 months and pitched just as many people and their businesses ended up failing and they probably should have given up a lot sooner. And I think that it's like that, that uh, desire to latch on to, well, that person did it for 21 months, so therefore I should keep going, right? Because maybe, maybe, maybe. Or the, the one company that gets down to like their last 5,000 in the bank and then somehow manages to turn around or the one that I hear all the time about like Dyson, you know, on his like 21st vacuum cleaner or whatever, you know, all these failures in front finally succeeded. So doesn't that mean that we shouldn't ever give up? And it's like, well, that's survivorship bias. But quitters never win, Annie. <laughs> quitters win a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> quitters win a lot. That's how they win. <laughs> Let's talk about the difference between uh, folding a hand, uh, winning a hand, losing a hand or a game or a career. Yeah. What is your time horizon? That It's super important. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that this is something that's really important is that it was actually, I, I had a conversation with Michael Mobison the other day where we were talking about this topic. And for people who don't know, Michael Mobison wrote a book called um, The Success Equation. It's about uh, how do you sort of tease apart the influence of luck and skill um, and outcomes. I highly recommend the book. Uh, he also has lots of white papers that you can find online. He's a good follow on Twitter. Um, but we we're talking about this, what you just talked about, like in terms of your time horizon, like how are you managing whether you can live to fight another day, right? So the issue is that uh, what we're trying to do over time is to make decisions uh, that are what we would call positive expected value. Uh, and positive expected value just means that the decision on average will cause you to gain ground toward your goals. Whatever your goals are, and those goals may be different for different people, the easiest way, of course, to think about expected value is money, right? So if I'm flipping a coin uh, and it's going to land heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time, um, Jonathan, if you're offering me $2 for every $1 that I bet, um, then uh, for every dollar I lose, I'm going to win $2. I'm going to have to do two flips to get that because it's 50-50, uh, which means that my positive expected value on the dollar that I'm risking 
is 50 cents. Okay. So, uh, so that means that that is a bet that I would want to take. But notice that I can't guarantee that on the le- next flip, I'm going to win. And I'm never going to win 50 cents, right? I'm either going to win $2 or I'm going to lose a dollar. 50 cents is just how much ground I expect to gain sort of over the long run, right? So that's really what we're trying to do with our decisions. And, you know, the coin flip example is a good example of the uncertainty, the influence of luck that we can't really help. And then we could make it more complicated because maybe we don't know if the coin is Mm 50-50. That would be some hidden information where we're guessing at that. But we can keep it simple. Um, So now the question is, um, you know, how do we manage that over time? And obviously, the way we manage that over time with something like a coin flip, it would be a really good idea not to bet all the money that you have on a single coin flip, right? Even if you're positive expected value, because uh, 50% of the time you're going to lose all the money you have. And that's really bad because uh, we want to think about the, do we have enough money for the next coin flip and the coin flip after that? We can think about that as decisions over time, right? We want to make sure that we're still like in the game. Okay, so that's like sort of simple how we're managing things over time. So it's good, uh, you know, not to bet everything that you have when uh, there's uncertainty of that type, right? Okay, so now we can go to like uh, the issue of folding. So now we're going to get more into the zone of is the coin 60-40? Is it not? I'm not sure. But we're making these guesses about whether we feel like we're in a situation where we're positive expected value or negative expected value. In other words, in a hand, I can say, I'm making some estimates, some educated guess about what my probability is of winning this hand. And I can think about that given different ways that I could play the hand, so on and so forth, right? But let's imagine that I'm considering uh, what are my, what are my chances of winning the hand versus how much is in the pot. So this is like, Uh, If I'm going to win the hand a third of the time, that means that uh, for every $1 I bet, there has to be $2 in the pot for me to break even because I'm only going to win a third of the time. So you can think about it as I would be contributing a third of what's in the pot. Out of $3 in the pot, $1 would be mine. And if I'm going to win a third of the time, that would be my break even point. So that's the way we would think about that. So what that means is that um, if I think I'm going to win the hand a third of the time, but I'm only getting $1 for every dollar that I bet, then that is no longer good for me. I will lose money in the long run on that situation, okay? Mm. So so once I feel that I'm in that situation, I'm actually just not supposed to play the hand anymore. So that means I'm supposed to fold, right? Because I don't want to get myself into situations where I'm negative expected value, where in the long run I'm expected to lose. Because even though, and this is where we have like, the Dyson problem or the person who waited 21 months and finally raised their round, even though there's some chance that I can win the hand. In fact, in the case that I'm talking about, you're going to win the hand 33% of the time. Even though there's that, that chance, it's not high enough that I'm actually making money on that proposition, right? And obviously, like we can think about, we can make it worse. Uh, maybe I'm going to win the hand 10% of the time, but I'm, I'm only getting... $2 for every $1 that I bet, I'm not supposed to play that, even though 10% of the time I will win. Just like some small percentage of the time I can go out for 21 months, you know, mm-hmm. and that small percentage of the time I'm going to win. But we always have to be thinking about, but is it worth it, right? Is it worth it for me to continue? And when I determine it's not worth it, it doesn't matter that, that I'm going to win 10%, that I'm giving up that 10% that I would win or that 33% that I would win because there's not enough money to make it worth my while. And the problem is that when I'm exchanging, if I do play, right, for preserving that chance that I win the hand, what I'm exchanging for that is that I am losing money in the long run to that. And I need to be focused on that long run proposition, right? I want to make lots and lots and lots of bets where I'm getting two to one when I'm going to win 50% of the time. I want to do that over and over again. And I'm trying my best to make zero bet where I'm getting two to one, but I'm only going to win 15% of the time. I'd like to make zero of those bets. Now, the problem we get into, of course, as decision makers is that giving up that chance to win is so hard. It's why people are so attracted to stories like Dyson's. It's why people, there were so many likes on that tweet. People loved that tweet. Like, oh, you're giving me permission not to fold. 
that's incredible because there's a chance I could win. Of course, there's a chance you could win. But is it is it worthwhile in two senses? One is, um, is it worthwhile in terms of the proposition that's sitting right in front of you? So I can think about that in poker. But also, is it worthwhile in terms of the opportunity cost, the other things that you could do, right? In poker, the other hands I could bet on with that same money, which will be a better proposition. Or we can also get outside the money and say, uh, what if you didn't use this, the time for this thing, for this project that's failing, and you use the time for another project, right? Would that time get a better return? Would that effort get a better return, separate and apart from money? Um, and we forget to think about those two things. Is this thing that I'm doing really worthwhile? And is it worth it in terms of what it's costing me in terms of other opportunities, other things that I could put this investment in? So in poker, we get really, really obsessed with these issues around folding because folding is, is the way, in fact, that we're able to make money in the long run because we're preserving our capital in situations where other people would invest that capital at a loss. There, I feel like there's this other thing too in your description is that we're looking at the money that's in the pot already that we <laughs> put in and we get attached to that, the sunk cost idea. Like how do we, how do we detach ourselves from that? Oh my gosh, Rochelle. Have you ever played poker, by the way? I have, but I, I'm not very well. <laughs> no, though, it doesn't matter whether you played it well or not. When you played, did you ever hear someone say the following sentence? Well, I couldn't fold. I had too much money in the pot. Yes. Every time you played, right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much, right? Yeah. So what you're bringing up is such a good point. So we can think about um, sort of what are the forces? And I think that this poke, what you just brought up about like this poker problem of there's money in the pot, right? Um, is My so money. good in terms <laughs> My of money, yeah. about, like, my money in the pot. Um, uh, is so good for thinking about like what are the things that are stopping us from actually folding in those situations. So just to give to level set people, professional poker players, just their two card starting combination will fold uh, on average somewhere between about uh, 70 and 85 percent of the time. Wow. Right. So you get dealt your first two cards. This is in a full game with like nine people. Uh, if there's two people, you play a lot more. But there's nine people at the table. You're playing the game of Texas Hold'em. You get two cards face down, they'll fold between 70 and 85% of the, the two card combinations that they're, they start with. Amateurs fold less than 50% of the time. Okay, so folding is really a thing that distinguishes expert poker players from um, amateurs. Okay, all right, so now let's go to what Rochelle, what you, you brought up. Okay, so why do we hear this thing? I couldn't fold, I had too much money in the pot. Well, so Sunk cost is so powerful. So for people who don't know, the sunk cost effect or the sunk cost fallacy is when we take into account resources that we've already spent in deciding whether to continue on and spend more. Okay, now, why is that irrational? Because the only thing that should go in your decision, into your decision about whether you should uh, continue doing something is whether going forward that thing is worthwhile. So it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. All we care about is I'm going to put the next dollar, my next dollar into this thing, or I'm going to put my next unit of effort, right? Or I'm going to put in my next unit of time into this thing. And do I feel going forward that that's going to be a, a, have a positive expected value that I'm going to gain ground toward my goals going forward? So a simple way to think about it is with a stock. Um, uh, let's say I'm looking at a stock and it's trading at 40 and I do all sorts of analysis. And I say, mm, no, nope, I don't think that that's a good bet for me. Okay, so I would, I'm not investing in it. The sunk cost fallacy makes it so that that very same stock that's by trading at 40, if I bought it at 50 and it's now trading at 40, I won't sell it. <laughs> Even though I wouldn't buy it today because I don't think it's worthwhile. Why won't I sell it? Because I have too much money in the pot. Right. Because I lost ten dollars on each share and I want to get that money back or I feel like I'll have wasted the money that I already put into it. Right. But of course, that money is already in there. Waste is not a retrospective problem. It's actually a prospective problem. So if we take the poker example, you put a lot of money in the pot. People take that into account in deciding whether to continue on. They'll say, I have too much money in the pot. They'll say, I need to protect the money. They'll say that, too. I need to protect the money that I had in the pot, meaning they don't want to waste it. They want to try to claw it back. Um, and what that means is that the next dollar they put in the pot is going to be at a loss 
right? So so we can think about like think about the situation where you're going to win 10% of the time. And uh, for every dollar you bet, you're getting $2 back. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that 10% of the time you're going to get $2, which is 20 cents. It's 10% times 2 is 20 cents, right? And at 90% of the time, you're going to lose a dollar. <laughs> so that's 90 90% of a dollar is 90 cents, which means your net loss literally on every dollar you put into the pot is 70 cents. So you're putting in money, giving away 70 cents at a time, trying to protect the money you already have in the pot because you already have so much in there, right? You don't want to give it up. So this is what the sunk cost fallacy does to us. And it's what causes us, you know, like you, we can think about this all the time in like, for example, product development or project man, you know, project management where we're engaged in some sort of project, right? And we had all sorts of forecasts about like how things were going to go and the progress we were going to make and how much money it was going to cost and how much time. And then we get in this situation where like way over budget, we've blown the timeline, we're not making progress. Maybe like we're not finding product market fit with our product or, or whatever. And objectively, if we knew those facts before we started, we wouldn't have started, which is the same thing as saying, I, I shouldn't continue, right? And yet, why do we still continue? Because I'll have wasted everybody's time. Unrealized you know, gains versus- I, I don't want to have done that, right? But but going forward, you're wasting everybody's time going forward. Just like in the poker example, I'm wasting 70 cents for every dollar that I put in, trying to somehow claw back what I already what I already invested. And it's such a huge error that we make. And you can see it across like all sorts of decisions. This is a super robust finding in psychology. So um, it was, it's, it's the thing that you probably see like the most in terms of an error Rochelle, like at the poker table in terms of the forces that are causing people not to fold. What about the, something like, I mean, is it, is it a simple heuristic? Like if you, knowing what you know now, would you start? And if the answer is no, you should quit. Is that like, is it that simple? So it is that it, it is that simple in one sense where it's not as simple is that having having already invested your answer to that decision will get distorted to, to that question. Rather, let me say that again. Having already started, your answer to that question will get distorted. So um, I, what happens to us is that as we think about what I started today, we'll we'll tend to rationalize in a way where if we were fresh to the decision, we would not do that. Uh, and we can see that uh, repeatedly across the science about the way that people think about the go forward situations. Um, and this is true um, even when we're sort of aware of the bias and we're trying to think about it as a fresh decision. So there's kind of two ways that we can deal with that or three ways, actually. Um, the first is that we can uh, clear the account. OK, so what do I mean by that? Uh, you you could try to hack it by saying, I'm going to sell the stock and then I'm going to decide whether I want to buy it again. So I'm going to come back to it the next day and decide whether I want to buy it again. And I'm sure that you can intuit that most people, be, after finally selling it, they'll be like, no, I don't, I don't want to buy that. Right. right. So, uh, so that just has to do with like a quirk of our mental accounting that when we have the account open, um, so like we buy a stock, we don't just open an account on our ledger, on our financial ledger. We also have a mental account that opens up. And and uh, this is work from Richard Thaler, the way that he thinks about this um, is we don't like to close accounts in the losses. There's actually like a really fun study that shows this, what happens when you clear an account. Um, they uh, The researchers looked at uh, people who were playing slots and you know how people have those casino player cards? And so they have like these rewards cards or whatever, and the mm. rewards cards, they stick them in a slot in the machine and the machine is tracking them. So it's tracking like uh, how much they're betting uh, in an hour, um, which then translates into like how quickly are they betting? How much are they betting at a time? Like what size are their bets? In other words, how much risk are they taking on? Right. Um, and what they so some researchers got that data, obviously blinded. It wasn't attached to any particular person. So personal information was removed. Um, and what they saw was that when people were losing, these were slot machine players, when people were losing, they started upping their risk. <laughs> so uh, their behavior would get riskier and riskier, right? Why, Rochelle? Because they're trying to protect the money they already have. 
right? They're trying to get their money back, right? So we can see this is very bad. So they start betting more. Maybe they move to bigger machines. Uh, they're betting more quickly, that kind of thing. But then what they found was that when the person left for whatever reason, like, you know, their partner came and dragged them out of the casino or whatever, when they would come back the next time and put their card back in the machine, their risk attitudes would go back to normal, right? So that, so when they're in it, right, when they're in the middle of the losing, um, they start to get really risky. But when, for whatever reason, the account closes and they can come back the next day, so they're fresh, like mm -hmm. selling the stock, they, they start, they approach the decision again in, in the way that they normally would, whatever their risk attitudes are. So that's one thing you can do, right, is you can actually what we think of is sell the position. We can shut the thing down and decide where they're going to start again. That's often quite impractical, uh, but, but you could do it, uh, but it's impractical. So what are the other two things that we could do? Uh, one is that we can decide in advance about the conditions under which we would quit. Uh, and when we decide in advance, there's just a lot of work on this, some of it from Hal Hirschfield, for example, who has a great book called Your Future Self, which talks about sort of some of these benefits of mental time travel. Um, when you decide in advance, it turns out that uh, it's kind of like not deciding for yourself. So you're not really in that, you're just much more rational because you're separated from a, the decision in the way that uh, you sort of almost think about the person who will decide that as a different person than you. So uh, you can be much more rational about it. So as an example, like let's say that the stock is trading at 40. I don't want to sell it today because I'm going to come up with all sorts of excuses as to why I should hold it. Mainly, it's really cheap now. Um, that would be the main reason uh, that I would come up with. Um, you can say, okay, I'm not going to sell it today, but what are the? let me think about the end of the week. What are the conditions under which I would sell it? What could I be seeing uh, in the market that would cause me to sell it? You can do the same thing with a project. That first moment that you're sort of thinking, mm, I'm thinking maybe this project isn't going anywhere. Uh, you can say, well, how long am I okay with not really making progress? Um, let's say that you say, I'm, I'm willing to give it two, two more weeks. That's fine. Uh, and then at the end of the two weeks, you would say, what are the benchmarks, right? So uh, if I hit the benchmarks or exceed them, I'm going to keep going. But if I don't, that will create a list of what I would call kill criteria, right? So if I've only made this much progress, if I spent this much money, uh, so on and so forth, right? If customer interviews, for example, are going in a certain way, I will quit under those circumstances. So it's uh, those kill criteria allow you to act more rationally. So when we get up to that two-week point, instead of a new rationalization, why well, should give it two weeks more, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now you, you actually will be more accountable to the kill criteria, those benchmarks that you set for yourself. And that's going to be much more helpful than just let me figure out how to approach the decision fresh, because this actually allows you to be a little fresher to the decision. And then the other thing you can do, which is really helpful, is get outside help. Because the thing is like, you know what, if you ask me about whether you should hold this stock, I'm not the one who lost the $10. You are. So I'm probably going to be much more rational in thinking about that um, than you are. So you can seek my help in determining whether you should quit. I could help you uh, create kill criteria. I could help to hold you accountable to those kill criteria. And, you know, I think intuitively we all know that because we all see people like engaging in projects or developing things or in relationships or uh, whatever, right? We're, we're looking at that and saying, why are you still doing this? this is <laughs> and they can't see it for themselves, but we can see it really clearly, right? So that's happening with other people looking in on us as well. And so we should really try to recruit other people's help, help in those decisions also. That will actually get you fresh to the decision. There's, there's a thing you talk about in one of the books about creating your own group of mm -hmm. people where you kind of put aside the social construct of, oh, keep at it and cheerleading for something that's really constructive. And I, I think your friend Eric, who yes. I loved, I love what he said, and I want to say that myself in the future. Um, it, this group that you put together, this feels like something soloists could, could benefit from. Yeah, actually. So it's interesting. Like, uh, so some of the coaching that I've done, because I, I do cons consulting, has been with solo PMs, pro portfolio managers, mm -hmm. um, you know, so they don't have a team, right, that can really help them with decisions. And, and one of the things that I do in my consulting work is I actually work with teams to construct decision processes that um, uh, will create, like, the, the highest quality decisions, really leveraging 
the the individual viewpoints of the team as well as possible, right? So the question is then what do you do if you don't have a team? Uh, so what I've done is I've actually created pairs of PMs. So I'll take solo, solo portfolio managers and I'll put them in pairs uh, so that they can create that, uh, you know, what you would call like a truth-seeking group or accountability coach or, or just really what we would think of as offering somebody the outside view, right? Because when we're on the inside of a, the decision, we're just so beholden to like, for example, what we've already spent on something, just as an example, uh, we're, we're much more like, you know, we're going to be more optimistic about our own chances than somebody else's. We're going to be more confident like your dad, right, <laughs> uh, um, about our decisions than we would be about somebody else's and those kinds of things. And so I'll pair them together. So when people are solo, I actually really recommend that they, that they form these groups. And then there's a couple of keys to the groups. Uh, the first is that it has to be understood within the group that there's permission for real feedback. So what we tend to do when we're giving people feedback is tell them what we think they want to hear right now. But what they want to hear right now is probably not what's good for them in the future, right? So, so like, let's say that someone's having trouble raising a round, right? Um, I, if they ask me, like, do you think this is worth it? Should I keep going? Should I return the capital to the investors? Like these kinds of questions. My first instinct is going to be to cheer them on and say, no, you're great. And you're, you know, you've got a great idea and keep going out to those angels because someone's going to, you know, whatever, right? Like it, it, I'm going to want to cheer them on, but that not, m might not be what's best for them in the long run. If they, if they butted up against enough information that tells them that this is not a product that the marketplace wants, and they're brilliant, which I assume I think that they are, it's probably better for me to tell them the truth, which is, I don't think this is a really good use of your um, treasure, right? Like, meaning your intellect and your time and your effort, and obviously money is included in there. I don't think this is a good use. You're so brilliant. You should probably move on to another opportunity and go focus on that. That's going to be the better thing for me to tell them in the long run, but it's going to hurt them in the short run. And so most people are unwilling to deliver that news. So when you, when you create these groups, and I really recommend that solos do create these groups, um, you know, you can think about it like a study group, but for adults, um, right? Because we do have study groups to try to help us as well. But um, you need, there needs to be this permission given, right? I need to give you permission to say, I would like to know your real thoughts. I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not going to um, excommunicate you. Um, I'm going to try my best to not be defensive. That might be a little bit hard. I might get a little defensive, but hopefully only momentarily. Um, and I'm really going to try to be open-minded to what you're saying because I value uh, your perspective, which is going to be better than mine about these things. So, um, you know, if you can get that permission going, uh, you can create a group that's really, really fantastic for uh, really improving um, your outcomes. And that's what I was doing with my friend, Eric, Eric Seidel, who as one of the best poker players to ever live, um, I went to him and I was whining to him about a hand that I lost. And he said to me, basically, is, is there a question in here? Because I really don't want to hear your whining. I don't really care. Uh, and his point was like, if I lost because of luck, there's nothing to be learned from it. But if there was a different way to play the hand that could have created a different outcome, in other words, if there were a question that I had about uh, strategy um, or tactics, uh, he was all there for that. And and this particular time, it was really just bad luck. Uh, I actually played the hand quite well. And I just got a really bad outcome. Um, so I just shut up and realized that if I'm going to go talk to him, that this is someone who's telling me he wants to tell me the truth and that I should accept that and go and only talk to him when I have real questions and not just to complain. Um, and that started me on my path to getting into one of these groups, because obviously poker players are solo operators also. So you need to find groups of people to, to work this stuff with. Excellent. Well, I know we're getting up to time. Um, maybe we could wrap on, I don't want to ask like a giant, huge question, but I, but a high level question about. We only have like 17 more on the list. So. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a three hour. <laughs> I'll try it. Let's do, we can do a speed round. Let's do a speed round <laughs> of 17 questions. Let's do it. What can you say just about the, it's my impression from this conversation in your material is that people are really bad at making decisions. There are all kinds of, in general, generally speaking, and, and that that, I mean, honestly, if there's like one skill that you could improve 
that's probably right near the top of the list. Yeah. So is that, do you think that's true or? So I, I actually, I actually wouldn't say that people are really bad at making decisions kind of across the board and generally. And we know that that's not true because we exist. So the problem is that there's certain shortcuts that our brains take that are ill suited to the complexity that we face today. So like, I'll give you an example of this, right? Um, uh, we have something called uh, availability bias. Um, and basically availability bias is that uh, the more available something is to memory, the more frequently we think it occurs. Now, when we were uh, evolving and we were in groups that were less than 300 people in very small territories, that was a very good shortcut because things that we came across a lot <laughs> were easier to recall and those were actually more frequent in the world. But obviously when we're in a global world, um, that uh, particular uh, bias is, it doesn't serve us very well uh, because we end up thinking, for example, that we really overestimate the probability that we're going to be involved in a terrorist attack, um, but really underestimate the chances that we're going to die in a swimming pool, right? Uh, because it just has to do with like, how, you know, if we're seeing things on the news a lot, for example, right, it becomes very available to memory, uh, even though it's actually not more frequent compared to other things, right? So. Um, horses are more dangerous than sharks by a lot, but we don't necessarily <laughs> think that as an example. All right, so that, that's an example. Like a lot of um, the things that we get out of tribe, um, you know, belongingness, distinctiveness, uh, you know, a shared sense of reality, those kinds of things. Those were great when we were in very small and isolated groups. Not so great um, necessarily in like a social media environment, right? So, so um, you can kind of think about it like, uh, our visual system works really well, but we but I can show you that you're taking shortcuts because I can create a visual illusion that exploits the shortcut that makes you see something that isn't really there. Um, and that happens with our decision making as well. Now, that being said, there are only two things that determine the way your life turns out, luck and the quality of your decisions. That's it. So you can't control luck. People who say, like, I make my own luck. It's not true. Uh, you make your own decisions that changes that change the probability of bad or good things happening to you. So uh, it will change sort of uh, how luck could uh, influence the, the outcome, but you don't have any control over luck. You have control over your decision. Um, so the fact that there are all these errors that we end up making in the complex world, right, where our shortcuts are, you know, the kind of heuristics that we use are going haywire means that you should be laser focused on the quality of your decisions, because that's the thing that can change the way that things turn out. If I can make it so that I'm not making bets where I'm losing 70 cents, <laughs> when I'm only making bets where I'm winning 50 cents, that's the quality of my decision that's going to determine that. And that's when it, that in the long run is going to determine whether things work out for me. It's almost like a stoic philosophy where just control the things that you can and, and don't worry about the ones you can't. Absolutely. Can. You become very, very sanguine about luck. It's like, it's there. <laughs> what am I going to do about it? Right? Like I have to really hone in on what's the quality of my decision. And some of the, you know, a lot of what you're focusing in on decision quality is trying to deal with uh, the places where these shortcuts really kind of lead us in the wrong direction. All right. Some of them, some of them, even as you said, I'm, like my brain gets it, but my gut is like, no. Mm -hmm. I, and I know for me, that's true, right? Like, I know about sunk costs and I still mm -hmm. don't want to give stuff up. Right. Like I, I, you know, I fall, you know, I fall into all these traps and um, in fact uh, there's evidence that shows that people who uh, are familiar with biases actually have more problems with them because they think that knowing about it fixes it. Oh, right. So that a guard is down. Yeah. We're yeah. just smarter. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, and then they become overconfident. Um, uh, which is bad. So, um, so you just have to really think about like if you can change the process and and try to figure out like how can I change process in order to in order to improve decisions. It's such a huge competitive advantage because most people aren't focusing on it. Excellent, Rochelle. Anything to wrap up? Um, so we're not going to do the lightning round. I thought we were going to do <laughs> oh, the lightning round. Oh, go for it. Lightning round. Well, you, you've got you've got the your list of seventeen. If you're, if you're I'll, up I'll for it. Let's do it. I'll, I'll, do I'll start round. though. I'll Let's start go. though. Backcasting. Oh, so backcasting is a way to uh, um, do some time travel 
to um, get yourself out of the moment. So remember I said like one of the things you should be thinking about is like, what will it, you know, how long am I okay with it? Let me think about what happens in two weeks. So backcasting is a very particular tool where um, you imagine it's some time in the future and you've gotten a good result. And now you do an extra step. You work backwards from there to try to figure out what are the things that I did and the decisions that I made that got me to the good result. Uh, and that is a, a helpful thing to improve decision quality. Because again, anytime you're not thinking in the moment and you're getting into the future and kind of working backwards from that future, you're usually going to do better in your decisions. Feedback loops. Oh, How do you, what if you loops. have really long feedback loops on the, on the decision? I love that. There is no such thing as a long feedback loop. Ooh. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. There's no decision where uh, you make the decision and then like you go to sleep and the world stops and you wake up and then you find out the outcome. So this is something I talk about, for example, in early stage venture a lot, right? So if you, if you invest in a company at seed, uh, you don't get to the actual exit until often a decade, right? Uh, but so we would sort of traditionally think about that as a long feedback loop. But of course it's not because there's all things that happen all sorts of things that happen in that 10 years. Like if you invest it, if, if you get an investment at seed, um, here's a question, uh, you know, or if you invest at seed, rather than saying it, if you invest at seed, uh, does the company you invest in raise a series A? Okay, well, that's going to happen depending on the pace of the market between six and 16 months, right? Like that's, that's a lot faster. And even before they raise a series A, you find out all sorts of things like how's, how, you know, are they developing their product? Are they getting customers? Are they starting to generate revenue? Are they hiring good talent? All of those things. So we actually have much more control over what the feedback looks, looks like, loop looks like than we think we do. We just think about the feedback loop as like final outcome. But there's all sorts of things in between that are signaling how that decision is going. And we should be paying more attention to them so that we can start to close those feedback loops much more quickly. Ooh, Perfect. Pre-mortems. Um, so a premortem is just the opposite of a backcast. So instead of imagining a good future, you imagine a bad future. Now, I recommend doing premortems much more than I recommend doing backcasts. And the reason why is that we're overly optimistic uh, and we're overconfident. So premortems are really helpful in terms of saying, um, what does a bad version of the world look like? And what are the decisions that I made that might have gotten me there? And then sort of working out a plan to try to avoid those decisions because it puts you in a less confident state, which is good because <laughs> we're overconfident. So we'd like to try to correct for that. Quitting when you've gone against conventional wisdom in a big way. Yeah. So when you've gone against conventional wisdom, quitting is really hard. So that, that's when we really have to put some good process into place, get ourselves a quitting coach, have really good kill criteria. Um, and the reason is that when you've got against, when you've gone against the green, uh, whatever you've chosen to do becomes much more integrated into your identity, uh, becomes much more of, you know, I actually talked about with groups, not just belongingness, but distinctiveness, right? So it defines what makes me distinct from other people. Uh, and when we're distinct from other people, that defines our identity much more, um, which means that it's going to be harder to quit because we don't like to quit things that, um, well, we don't like to quit who we are, right? So like the way that I, I think this is a good analogy um, if I believe Pluto is a planet, everybody else does too. So when you show me evidence that Pluto isn't a planet, I'm like, whatever, Pluto's not a planet. Change my belief super easily. <laughs> totally fine, right? But if I believe the Earth is flat, right? Now I'm distinct from other people. And if you show me evidence that the Earth is not flat, I will be much less likely to quit that belief uh, because I don't want to quit my identity. So we need to be really careful. And this is true, by the way, particularly of solo operators, right? Is that the decisions you make, the things you choose to pursue, uh, they become much more part of your identity because it's not even like that there's consensus or the rest of the group is doing something. And so that can become a big impediment to quitting. So you need to start thinking about like, how do I implement these cold kill criteria? How do I get into a group of other people where we can sort of become like quitting coaches for each other or a truth seeking group? Uh, you have to put in extra stuff in place when you stand out from the crowd. That was my list. Any more, exactly. Rochelle? No, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you not did. bad. Yeah, that was a real lightning round. That was a real lightning round. I yeah. like that. Fantastic. Well, Annie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure everyone is going to get tons of value out of this. And we will link to your amazing books in the show notes. Uh, everyone really should check out at least one. Thinking in Bets was the, my favorite book I read that year. 
it was really, you know, because the you want to bet line yeah. was just yeah. changing. And there's my some life. great stories in there that illustrate all the things that Annie's been talking about. So, highly recommend. Let, let me just say, by the way, let me just explain why want to bet work. Okay. So, um, you know, as I said, there's two things that influence our decisions one is luck, and the other is uh, hidden information, uh, what we don't know. So, when I stand up there and say, I guarantee, right, like, I guarantee that we're going to hit our sales target this month. Um, like, Rochelle, if you say want to bet to me, <laughs> what that does is it reminds me, oh, hold on a second, right? Like, it it causes me to uh, focus in on the uncertainty, right? So when you say want to bet, a couple of things happen. One is I'm thinking about, well, wait a minute, there could be luck here, like I could get unlucky and not hit the target. So maybe I shouldn't guarantee, or there's things that I don't know. And maybe I'm going to find some stuff out later that I wish I had known now um, that will make it so that I, I shouldn't really be guaranteeing this. And then the second thing that's really good with want to bet is that I'm going to say, hmm, what does Rochelle know that I don't know? Because she seems to be willing to bet me. And so that gets me into really starts to, to get me to dig into like, maybe there are things I don't know. And maybe the person on the other side of this uh, actually knows things that I don't know. So maybe I ought not be so certain. So want to bet is just a really good tool for getting people to to sort of go back into the embracing of uncertainty and out of that like total overconfidence. Because uh, I think we all recognize like if we bet in situations where we're guaranteeing something, but it's only going to happen like, you know, 60% of the time, we'd probably lose a lot, uh, not just reputationally. So that's really what that does for you, right? And, and you can you can see that, right? Like when you, it, you know, if even even when you're pretty sure of something, right? So if I'm like, if I say like, oh, the Eagles are playing this Sunday and you say, want to bet, I'm like, oh, wait, I think I know that. But like games also get played on <laughs> Thursdays and they get played on Mondays and maybe they have a bye. Ooh, I should go check that, right? And it makes you go like seek out other information that one is going to help you to realize like, maybe I actually don't know. But the other is it's going to it can often be like corrective information that will really uh, improve your decision quality. So it's like it's such a great tool to use to really sort of get you into a good place in terms of the way you're approaching a decision. Cool. Love well, it. What can we look forward to from you next? Oh, gosh. Well, um, let's see. Uh, I do a sub stack. Oh, called Thinking and Bats. That's actually. how we started talking, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So people can go and and check out the Substack. Um, I teach, uh, sometimes teach cohorts um, for decision making on a platform called Maven. I'm actually right now kind of trying to plan when my next cohort is going to be. Um, depending on whether I do three classes a week or two classes a week, it's it's either a two or three week um, course where it's really like. Uh, sort of an intermediate um, uh, approach to decision-making, which really starts to build out for people. Like, how do you think about it? How do you start to think about building out process? Um, so that's kind of fun. So they sh should expect to look at that from me. And then I'm actually at the, I'm mulling over another book. Ooh. But I haven't, I haven't molded enough to <laughs> know for sure that I'm going to write it. But I know it's a topic I'm really passionate about. And so I'm trying to think about, how I would approach it, like what the right frame for it would be. So I don't know, maybe, maybe this time next year, I'll, I'll have a book coming out. We'll see. Want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> After what I said, you, it would depend on the price, right? Like, I mean, this is the thing. If we really want to get into want to bet, I could say, oh, sure, lay me 10 to one. Because then I only have to have done it 9% of the time in order to break even. But, um, <laughs> but you know so uh, i it, it depends on the price no i i'm, I'm really not sure where that's going to go I'm, I'm pondering it i am um, uh you know i feel like i released three books in the space of four years and then as soon as quick came out and i was done promoting that i wrote a dissertation yes, um so uh it's been it's been a lot and i'm I'm trying to put some space between me and the next book. It's just that I have this topic that's sort of eating away at me. So we'll we'll see. We'll see. How well, it goes. fingers crossed. We'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. All right, folks. That's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time for the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye-bye.